Hi to everyone. It's not quite as cold as it was. I'm not wearing my furry jumper anymore. I think that spring is coming. I was reading about how freezing cold these winters were in China, out in Yangcheng, where Gladys Elwood was, and they measured how cold the winter was um, by the coats they wore. And an averagely cold winter was called a two-coat winter and sometimes they had a three coat winter when it was really bitterly cold and Gladys said she even remembers a four coat winter when some of the days were so perishingly cold that they had to wear four coats. The good thing for us is that the spring is now beginning to come. Very exciting. So we're back with Gladys Elwood in the next bit of the story. Do you remember this young woman from North London um, whose heart has been set on fire by God in those revival meetings when she was 19 and she goes out to China having been turned down by the missionary societies, travels out in that Trans-Siberian Railway, has that extraordinary adventure as she, I don't know if it's an adventure for her, but extraordinary experiences. Uh, she ends up walking in the snow and in those woods. She's arrested by Russian officials twice. She is she ends up in Japan to the west of China, has to go back on the boat, paid for by the Christians there, and they send her back to China and she ends up finally after about five or six weeks in Yangchen with Mrs. Lawson, uh, who is wanting to set up um, an inn for the mule trains that are coming through um, in that area, and she is praying, beating on the very door of heaven itself that God would do something and something wonderful begins to happen um, and muleteers begin to come they come and they spend the evenings on these kangs these long warmed platforms where they sleep and they listen to the stories of Jesus um, and something begins to happen and some of them become Christians and something wonderful is happening with Gladys Elwood too she's beginning to get the language they said she spoke it so beautifully and so wonderfully in the end and then suddenly Mrs Lawson dies just a year after she's been there and just before she dies she said to Gladys Elwood it wasn't an accident that you came out to, to me here God called you here in answer to my prayers and he'll provide for you and then do you remember the Mandarin comes with his scarlet coat and he says I want you to be my foot inspector I want you to go out and unbind the feet of the children I want you to go into every home I'm going to send my soldiers with you to guard you and she said afterwards I went into my room I fell on my knees in worship and thanksgiving the way was clear my place was here God's plan for my life was unfolding before me so she goes out into those villages right across in that region um, and she wrote at that time I had longed to go to China but never in my wildest dreams had I imagined that God would overrule in such a way that I would be given entrance into every village home and have authority to banish a cruel and horrible custom and have government protection and be paid to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as I inspected feet. She wrote at that time, this was my country now. These were my people. She was the first Western missionary to become a naturalised Chinese citizen, giving up her British citizenship to be out there. God was doing something wonderful. And then do you remember we heard last week about the next part of the story where she sees a little girl by the roadside and she's dying and she has to give the woman some money, the equivalent of nine pence in British money, to uh, let her take this child and care for her and prevent her death. And this little child thrives, is called ninepence and more children come um, another one called less and then bow bow or precious bundle a baby came another little two-year-old called dusty heap because they found him on a dusty heap he also came these were desperate abandoned children and they gathered around gladys and then Mrs. Ching came from one of the villages who had been uh, treated like a slave and she brings with her five little girls whose feet are unbound and they all come to live at the inn and the work among the children grows and it grows. Um, and the work among the muleteers continues on at the inn uh, with both the Chinese Christians and Gladys now telling the story these stories of Jesus, night after night, to the men as they sat there listening. And in the end, the place became called, called the Jesus Courtyard. It was known as the Inn of Eight Happinesses, but also the Jesus Courtyard. And the foot inspector work continued and it became a divine work out in these villages. Everywhere Gladys went, she brought the message of Jesus, this 
gospel of Jesus, which the Bible says is the very power of God. It has the very power of God within it. And, and a number of small churches grew up and she says she remembers after several years being out in the fields and hearing um, the Christians singing as they're working out in the fields, they're singing the songs of Jesus because the message was filling their hearts. I want the message to fill my heart too. But there was more work to come. Um, and on the eastern side of the town, I mentioned this at the end last week, uh, there was a prison. Um, and one day, one of the guards from the prison came running into the courtyard where Gladys was, and he said, there's a riot in the prison, and the convicts, the men are killing each other, and the prison governor needs you to come. And Gladys Edward said, I can't be involved in this. I'm not involved with the prison. Um, I'm just a missionary here working among you. I can't come to the prison and sort out a riot. He said, the prison governor isn't asking you to come, Miss Edward. He's, he's ordering you to come. And so she reluctantly goes to the prison. And the governor says to her, we need you to go in and stop this riot. And she can hear the men shouting and this tremendous noise going on inside. And all the guards are outside the prison, not in it. And she said, well, you need to send the guards in. And he said, they're too afraid. And she said, I can't stop a prison riot. He said, no, no, you can't. But you told us that you have the living God with you and that he'll protect you. So you're the one that needs to go in. And she suddenly realised this was her Daniel in the lion's den moment. This was her fiery furnace moment. Daniel could have walked away from that situation. He didn't have to kneel and pray. Those young men could have bowed down to that image. They didn't have to go into that fiery furnace. And she knew she needed to demonstrate that God was real. And so she prays an arrow prayer. An arrow prayer is a split second quick little prayer that you pray to God. You shoot out your cry to him. And her prayer Prayer, her arrow prayer was, oh God, give me strength. And then they opened the door and they, she said it felt as though they pushed her in and then they shut the door, this huge prison door behind her. And she looked down this tunnel, um, a sort of walkway. Um, and at the end, there were the men. Um, and she could see them rioting and fighting and shouting and she could see what she thought were dead men lying around and in the middle of it all there was a man with a huge axe and he's waving it above his head and he swings round and he catches sight of her standing there and everyone freezes and they're looking at her and then she she hears her voice shout out give me the weapon and incredibly Instead of bringing the axe down on her, he hands her the axe and she manages to calm the men down. God must have so helped her. And she says to them, what is going on here? Why are you killing each other? Why are you behaving like this? And she's starting to see them and, and they're, in, they're in rags and they're cold and they're desperately thin and they begin to tell her it's too terrible in here we can't survive in here we don't have enough food we have nothing to do all day we're sleeping in cages at night we're cold and she was shocked by the condition of the men and so she promised them she said I'm going to speak to the governor and I'm telling you things are going to change in the prison and one of the men as she left called out and she, he said our way day and it means virtuous one, good one. It was like he was calling out and saying, what you're doing for us is good. Um, he later became a Christian. His name was Feng. And true to her word, she spoke with the governor. They began to give them more food. What was happening was that there was almost no food in the prison. The, the men only got food if the families came and brought it for them. So if you didn't have a family bringing you, a family bringing you food, you didn't have any food. And so the men were half starved. And so they gave them more food. The Christians began to visit the prison and then there was an amazing day when they, the, the prison governor allowed them to all walk. They were all in their shackles around their, their ankles um, and they walked in lines up to the Inn of Eight Happinesses and they heard the gospel preached up there by, by Gladys and others and some of them became Christians. There's a final amazing bit about these prisoners at the end of this story. And then in 1937, a shadow falls across Yang Chen and, a part, and across that part of China because the Japanese begin to invade. And Yang Chen becomes a sort of war zone. It's caught up between warring factions. 
refugees are moving around there are wounded people uh, there become uh, food shortages in that area and just at that point the christians were planning a huge a gathering together um, of the christians right across that whole province and uh, um, gladys elwood was involved in that and they were going to come and gather in yang chen and, and and seek the lord and pray together and they thought well we're just going to still go ahead with this so they all begin to gather, they come in trucks and some of them walk, some of them several days across the mountains uh, to reach that area. And in the end, there were a thousand people gathered to seek God. And the visiting speaker who was supposed to come can't come because he's stopped by the Japanese invasion. Um, and on that first night, they hear a Chinese soldier praying um a, a devout christian and they realize that he knows god in a deeper way than they do and they invite him to lead the meetings his name was jonathan wen and on the first night he challenges the christians to rededicate their lives to god um, and then as they do that there's an outpouring of the holy spirit and they have five extraordinary days together this is what gladys said we had no time to bother about eating or sleeping we had prayed for revival and now it had come like a mighty flood Every day, dozens accepted the Saviour for the first time. Women, men and women from across the town came in to see what it was all about. And before long, they too were on their knees. How great was our joy that at last the years of faithful sowing were resulting in this abundant harvest. On the final morning of the conference, when they were due to leave, Gladys Aylwood woke and heard a roaring noise. And she grabbed Bao Bao, the baby, and she, she rushed into the courtyard because she thought that maybe the enemy planes were coming over. And she said, instead of an enemy plane, a wonderful and amazing sight met my eyes. Hundreds of men and women were praying. Some were kneeling, some were standing. It was the final prayer meeting. A power that I can only liken to that of Pentecost had swept over the place. And in a moment I too was on my knees, awed and full of great reverence. There was a final pouring out of the Holy Spirit before they left. And as they left, they began to hear the rumours coming that the full-scale Japanese invasion was about to start. So as they, as they grouped together to say goodbye, they knew that for many of them, they were seeing each other for the last time. Just a few weeks later, bombers were seen above the skies in Yangchen and bombs began to fall on the town including on the inn of eight happinesses and we're going to hear some more about this next week oh god uh, we worship you you are the god of daniel you are the god of moses you are the god of gladys aylwood and you are our god we worship you, you are the king, you are eternal, you are immortal, you are invisible, you are the only God and you alone are wise and to you belongs all glory, all honour and Jesus in our hearts we worship you today.